Check one, two. Go! Go! Curious about real estate? Yes! Then you've come to the right place. Get the knowledge you need. Get over the fear and get started. This is the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show with your host, Michael Quarles. Hello, everybody. Michael Quarles with the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. Welcome to a podcast episode 255. Kind of cool. We have five scenario questions sent in today, and I'm going to try my dangdest, my darndest, my bestest to answer them. I hope you guys are enjoying these things. And, and if you are, jump on up to iTunes, where most of you listen to this from, and or by, and you know, give me some reviews. You know, write something cute down and make me smile and laugh. Don't make me cry. I'm crying a long time. Don't want to cry now. And, you know, if you find them entertaining, if you find them worth listening to, worth your time, yeah, say something good. I'd appreciate it. I really would. Um, it helps out a lot. Anyway, here we go. Question number one. How often should I reevaluate my goals and set new ones? Mm, boy. I set goals every day, you know, but my, what I'm going to do tomorrow kind of thing, evaluate uh, weekly, monthly, 12 weeks, six months, 12 months. So you, you kind of do them in stages. You have big goals, long-term goals. You have inter, little intermediate goals. You have shorter term goals. You have weekly goals and then you have daily goals. So I like goals. Think about it. You go to the airport you, you, you drive to LAX, you drive to Dallas, you drive to some huge airport, you park your darn car, you don't know where to park it because you just, you don't know where you're going. So, you know, you park it in the Delta Terminal area, in the United, you know, Southwest, whatever. Imagine that for a second. You go to the airport to go someplace, I'm sure it's not sea airplanes, and, but you don't, you've not set any goals. You don't know where you want to go. You haven't bought the ticket. You haven't reserved the hotel room. You don't have luggage with you. You, you just didn't plan. You didn't set any goals. That's what most of us do in life. I mean, every day is the airport, but we just get out of bed. We just go, whatever the time, whatever the clock tells us to do, whatever our boss tells us to do, whatever the sellers tell us to do, whatever the contractors tell us to do. You know, they tell us, oh, I need a two by four. We're going to, okay, I'll be right back. Oh, I need a screw. Okay, I'll be right back. No, no, set goals. One of the goals should be, I'm going to stop being the gopher. I'm going to stop being the guy that is always the guy that goes and does everything for everybody else and can't plan the life on their own. There's, there's a goal for you. Now, you know, back up and listen to that again. There's, there's some wisdom there. I get lucky every once in a while. But yeah, daily, weekly, if 12 weeks. Or monthly, 12 weeks, six months, 12 months. I like tasting my goals too. And I like knowing what it's going to feel like achieving that goal. I remember I came out of, I don't know, with my wife, some restaurant. And um, there was a stud. I mean, this guy was just jacked, got yoked up. He was just, he got out of this beautiful car. I mean, I had a nice car at the time. I had a, a, a nice Mercedes, a really nice car. But he made my car want to disappear. It was so embarrassing. He got out of this nice car. All I could say, I mean, he was, I mean, my wife looked at him. He was just like Adonis kind of thing, and which is, I, you know, I'm, I'm fine with. I don't get jealous. My wife wants to check out some guy's bun, buns and, and pecs and all that arms, all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm for it, man. <laughs> I always live by the adage, you know, it, it's, it, it doesn't matter where she gets her appetite. It, where, it matters where she eats. And um, so, yeah, yeah, she can check out all the guys she wants. Because she knows I'm checking out, the, you know, the other side of that fence. Because there's some beautiful people in life, man. We've got to reward ourselves. God gave us two eyeballs for a reason. Anyway, I, digressing here, I guess. I apologize. I, sometimes I get up on these tangents. I'm just having fun, guys. So, so here we are. Guy's got this gorgeous car. Got this gorgeous car. And I said to myself, I want one of those. I want to feel what that feels like. To get out of your car. 
I mean, I told him, I mean, nice car. Well, I'm not going to say a nice butt, but I had a nice car. Probably had a nice butt to my wife. I don't know. But nice car. But I wanted to feel what that felt like. So, you know, I, I got onto my, my Bentley thing where I wanted to go out and buy a Bentley. And, well, actually, I didn't start out with Bentleys. I started out with an exotic car, you know, a nice car. And I looked at them all. I looked at, um, the, you know, the fast cars. But I'm not, I'm not that, yeah, that would have been me like 10 years ago, but it's not me today. Although my Bentley goes 201 miles an hour, zero sixty 60, less than four seconds. So it's pretty damn fast. But it doesn't look like that, you know, over the top fast thing. It just, it looks like just, you know, your station wagon kind of thing, I guess. But I was kidding. So I, I start out this track and I wanted to go and see the Bentley once I decided on the Bentley. I get this Rob Report magazine and man, it had one, one edition was all the, the exotic cars. And so I limited it to the Bentley. So I wanted to see the, the Bentley. So I drove down to the Bentley dealer. I parked my Mercedes out in front of the Bentley dealer. I was ashamed of myself almost a little bit. We're in flip-flops, t-shirt, I mean, sorry, flip-flops, shorts, and a polo shirt. And I went in there and took this thing for a drive. And I just knew I had to have it. It felt good. Put it on my goals and bought the darn thing. My next car is a uh, Rolls-Royce Wrath Convertible. This thing, man, gorgeous. Gorgeous car. Anyway, here we go. Question number two. How do I land, analyze land to determine a value? Do I use comps? Absolutely. You analyze land just like you analyze anything else. And um, one of the nice things about land, um, if it has had something built on it that needs to be torn down, there's some value there in those permits that don't have to be repaid for, or repurchased. You know, some of the, the costs there are pretty good. Yeah, same way. Land realtors are land realtors or brokers agents. So understand that land's going to cost you more to sell. You know, we're in, in the normal real estate business. We, we spend 6 7% uh, to sell a house. In the land business, that could be 10 15% to sell land because it's harder to sell. It's, it's not, as very, not as many people sell land. And, yes, everybody can sell land, but don't have everybody do that. A house seller is a house seller. A commercial broker is a commercial broker. A land broker is a land broker. And, um, yeah, easy to ter- determine values. Just call comparable sales. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back. Are you running out of leads? It's time you tried Yellow Letters at yellowletters.com. Get motivated seller leads through yellow letters, postcards, zip letters, typed professional letters, greeting cards, door hangers, and business cards. Yellow Letters is a full-service marketing company created with your success in mind. Get the personal attention you need to get your direct mail campaign started and get in touch at yellowletters.com. And we are back in three, three, two, two, one. one. Question number three. I know you have a vanity phone number, but it, would it be worth it for someone to get a vanity number if I'm not a full-time investor? Oh, absolutely. If you can get one, oh my goodness. Just, these are the things, these are the midnight tasks to do. You know, you watched you know, Perry Mason or something. And you, you know, you, you, you it, your favorite shows off bachelor at bachelorettes off the, the air and you're sitting there. It's 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, whatever it is. What do you do? This is the time you jump on, you know, AT&T is a really good search engine that you, you know, Google AT&T vanity numbers, and it's a really easy search engine to use. This is when you start dreaming, thinking, you know, finding the available, try to stick to the 800 numbers, although they have 888-877-866-855-844. Kind of everybody knows the 800 is kind of like the dot com. It's the leader. So that's better. But yeah, you could find one of those. But make sure it's relevant, easy to remember, makes sense. So just be, you know, it could be like 1 800 sun pool. Well, if you don't sell sun and you don't sell pools, won't make any sense for someone. So make sure it's relevant to what you do. And how I found mine. Give you a little, a little hint. I was doing this very same thing. Um, and uh, I, I tend to, my mind's always going. I mean, I'm always, you know, what's next for me kind of thing. So I just think that's what an entrepreneur does. We never settle. We're never, you know, we're, we're never satisfied. 
I mean, I like what my life, and I'm happy with my life, but I'm never satisfied. I always want more today than I had tomorrow. I want to do a better job tomorrow than I did today. So I'm never satisfied. So I was just going using the AT&T vanity number search thing, and, and none of the ones that I wanted were available. So then I, um, I, I started writing down vanity numbers, and I started calling them. And I wanted to find the one that would answer, but not as the vanity number. You know, like I had, um, or as an example, 1-800-WE-BUY-HOUSES. Let's assume, and, but they answered it, Harry's Plumbing Shop. Well, they didn't know what they had. And um, so I kind of did that, figured out, had a little schematic, you know, in use, in use other industry. And then the last one was not in use. So someone owned it. But it just went to an answering machine. You know, hey, you, you contacted Harry, um, and I'm out like fishing. Uh, call me back kind of stuff. Well, my 1-800 sell for cash was that very thing. The guy had it, wasn't utilizing it, went to his voicemail, and he, whether he knew what he had or didn't know what he had didn't make any sense to me because he wasn't utilizing it, so therefore I knew it was a dead asset to him. And if I negotiated correctly, it'd be a great asset for me. So then my next step was I went to the internet, to Google, not Google, GoDaddy. I like GoDaddy for some things. I like GoDaddy for a lot of things. Uh, I like GoDaddy on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 used to be what I would say for GoDaddy. I'm going to say like 7 and 3 quarters now because their service sucks lately. Not that it sucks. Like if you call someone else, they, they still have great service, but they don't have as good a service as they used to. So if that makes any sense. But anyway, you know, jump on GoDaddy. And I wanted to see if the number that wasn't in use was a website or not. So, you know, I, I typed in 1-800-SELL-FOR-CASH.COM. He didn't have it. I bought it. I bought every variation of it. They're only like 13 bucks. So I like 17 of them. You know, what's 13 times 17? You know, 200 and something bucks. Who cares? But that was the leader. So when I actually made contact with him and I say, hey, you're, you've got a phone number you're not utilizing. And you think about selling it? And he didn't call me back. Call him again. Call me back. He says, yeah, you called. Yeah, I was on whatever, whatever excuse he had. And I said, yeah, what do you think? Of, you know, and he says, well, let me, let me talk to my wife and let me get back to you. Okay. I understand. I appreciate my wife needing to be on the decisions, but some decisions I can make without my wife. This would be one of those. Anyway, he calls me back and he says, Oh, looks like you own the websites. Yes, I do. Oh, uh, well, I was, I was going to keep it, but since you own the websites, I'll sell it to you for X dollars. And his number was ridiculously low. I mean, if I was a starter investor, it wouldn't be so ridiculously low. Because I could have used the money doing something else, but if I had that kind of money sitting around, not you know, just drawing dust and and, and spider webs, man, that's great. I said absolutely. So we went on to escrow.com. We escrowed it through there. I mean, it was pretty painless, you know, a couple hundred dollars in escrow fees, and um, now I've got a vanity number, and um, so that's kind of cool. But absolutely, fall forward on the vanity number. Question number four, if there is an area I'm interested in buying, but it's highly competitive market, should I avoid it or dive in? I'm breathing heavy because here's, I'm going to ask you a question and let you answer the question, but I'm going to ask it about a different topic. Let's assume for a second you're single. And you, you, you don't want to be single. So you're single, but you don't want to be single. Do you, would you have better luck going to some place that single people were at in abundance, you know, both male and female, over going to some place that may have a few of what you're looking for but very few of who you are. Which one would be better? And the reality, and it's, it's actually a mathematical formula or theory, 
that having a crowd creates better benefit. So going to the club or the entertainment facility or whatever it was where there was a lot of the folks that you were looking for and there was a lot of folks like you actually does increase your opportunity to buy over the facility that there's some people of what you are looking for, but very few people like yourself. Because what you're doing is you're building off the cluster of like type individuals and it works. So I hope that answers that question. Question number five, do I need to completely close on a property to hotel? Uh, Yes. Well, I say yes really fast. In order to resell it, you have to close on it. So you're not assigning. Hotel is not assigning. But to initiate the opportunity to sell, no. So I'm going to enter into an agreement to purchase. I'm going to enter into an agreement to resell, but I'm always going to buy it before it close. And my, my instrument that I'm using to resell is contingent upon my instrument I'm using to purchase. But I'm always buying the property, but I don't have to own the property prior to selling the property. So I hope that makes sense. So I'm not buying it, then selling it. I'm buying it, offering it for sale, entering into an agreement to sell, closing on my purchase, and then closing on my resale. Man, I had fun. A little, I guess I just got off on tangents and I... I apologize. Hope you guys laughed at me. I appreciate it if you did. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. Get more info and stay in touch at michaelquarles.com.